Hey, sickos. I'm LJ. And I'm Toe. And this is Say Psycho Right Now. Say Psycho Right Now is a true crime and paranormal podcast. Some content may be considered disturbing or graphic. We don't typically provide trigger warnings due to the nature of the content we discuss. Listener discretion is advised. We are also potty mouths. If you're not put off by that, shout out you. Buckle up and get ready for another episode of Say Psycho. To shop brand merchandise, access our socials, or become a Patreon member with access to early episodes and bonus content, find us on any social media platforms and consult the link tree in our bio, or go to www.patreon.com slash psycho right now. You can also follow us on our socials or wherever you stream your podcasts and leave a five-star review if you're enjoying our content so that we can continue to reach more people. Following us on Patreon enables us to produce more content and enables you to access more content. So we highly recommend checking that out. Now let's get into today's episode. Hey, sickos. Thanks so much for joining us again today. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Beautiful. So I truly, usually this is the part where we're like, if you're listening to this, the last episode that you heard was dot, dot, dot. We are weird right now and we don't know what the episode before this one's going to be. So you guys will know what we're doing the week before before we do this time yeah we can't Sometimes, even look at the calendar and answer our own question right now because nope. it's just it's not answerable <laughs> yep so you guys are living in the future knowing what we did hope it was good thanks for coming back um hope you, liked it. Hope you loved it and today we have a long-awaited case That really took a lot more research than I thought it was going to. I don't know why I thought this was just going to be like, oh, this is a fun episode. I'll just crank it out. It's the dark history of Playboy. And let me just tell you, guys, I have 13 pages of notes on this, not double spaced or anything, just 13 typed pages of notes. So buckle up, kitty cats. (laughs) Grab (laughs) a sneaky snack. Grab a drink. As we record this, Toe and I will be deciding together if this is going to be a two-parter or a one-parter. So right now we just don't even know, babes. We don't even we're just, know. We're so. winging it. We're winging it so hard. I did draft up a fun little something something for today. So okay. for liability purposes, this is in jest because only do this if you want to die. But we're going to do an a little like... If you want alcohol poisoning, take a shot for this episode. So take a shot every time that Hugh Hefner's advocacy for freedom of speech is mentioned. Take a shot every time someone says that Hugh Hefner deterred them from exercising their own free speech. 
take a shot every time you see the misogyny coming from inside the house, aka inside the Playmate Mansion. Take a shot every time you hear something, it makes you want to either A, dry heave, or B, scream, what? But don't actually take a shot for all of those things because you will actually die and our tiny podcast can't afford to be sued or lose valued listeners. So maybe don't do it. (laughs) Don't actually. Don't actually. Maybe take a shot of water because that's a good way to stay hydrated. Yeah. Or maybe just like tally it. Like if you're like at work listening or you're just like hanging out whatever maybe just like tally it and let me know yeah. just let me count know. it out somebody count it up for us and leave it in the comments perfect i would love that and if you take a shot like maybe hawaiian punch maybe or maybe just like stop once you get to like a preset limit of shots and let like us know at two. what minute mark let us know at <laughs> what minute mark the bartender cuts you off <laughs> i love that that's it that that's the vibe perfect okay so I also wrote up a a little case disclaimer for this one because I feel like this is just important to clear up ahead of time. So before we actually get too far in today's case, I just want to offer a disclaimer that in order to accurately provide an overview of the dark history of Playboy, I am going to be discussing a wide range of events. These will include murders, assaults, drug trafficking, sexual exploitation and abuse, child sexual abuse, bestiality, and other disturbing sur- subject I'm matters. I'm sorry, did you just say fucking bestiality? Yes, ma'am. Yes, that is a topic that comes up today. Okay, I hate that. Me too. Not as much other... as I hate the human skin books, let me just be clear. But <laughs> Become a Patreon if you want to hear about human skin books, which is now like a special interest of mine. <laughs> I hate that about myself, but it was a really cool episode to research. Okay. Perfect. But yeah, this episode in general covers a broad range of disturbing subject matters. In order to provide an accurate portrayal, I will also be recounting events and accomplishments relevant to the history of both Playboy and Hugh Hefner. Sharing both the positive and negative is not an effort to discredit or downplay any of the abuse exploitation or tragedy that has come to those involved in the story rather the intention is to also provide a viewpoint of what would have been portrayed in the mainstream media at the time versus what we now know to be a broader and more accurate picture of events behind the scenes due to the bravery of many who have come forward with their testimonies so i just wanted to get that disclaimer out there so people aren't like well why are you sharing like these good things or whatever like what's that supposed to mean it's just to be a full picture you know what i mean not to hype hugh hefner up but we all know he just was a piece of shit he was a swindly little butt bag (laughs) (laughs) i am storing that one in my arsenal i'm literally gonna write this down i'm not even kidding i'm literally gonna write this down on my phone right now it just came out swindly little butt bag is it just rolls off the everything kind of like kind of like w2 wtf igawick you know okay one of those things no no she said stop trying to make fetch happen it's never going to happen stop trying to make (laughs) I can't even WTF, say it. Igawick. WTF Stop Igawick. trying to make WTF Igawick happen. It's never going to happen. <laughs> hey, myself. Okay, so a little background on Hugh Hefner. He was born on April 9th of 1926 in Chicago, Illinois. He hey, was the why oldest. Is he in my month? Get the fuck out of my <laughs> month, you. Get- I own April. Yeah, we also have Hitler and we have Courtney Kardashian. Slay. Yeah. Perfect. Well, sorry, sorry Courtney Kardashian. I didn't mean to put you in the same Lump category as Hitler. Hitler and you. That wasn't my intention. <laughs> what the fuck? I was just trying to present, like, you know, a variety. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just over here, like, Slay, Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing better than some yeah so he was born in toby's month of april 1926 in chicago illinois 
He was the oldest of Glenn and Grace Hefner's two sons. A fun fact, if you're not like a little Zodiac girly slash Zodiac person, he was an Aries. Aries are generally passionate and confident leaders. They can be arrogant and ill-tempered. We're um, feral. Yeah, and he was especially feral. Zero stars him in my personal opinion that nobody cares about. Yeah. So also really interesting, Hugh Hefner reportedly tested with an IQ of 152 and okay. attended both the University of Illinois where he graduated with a bachelor. Of, why did I say both? He just, not both. He attended the University of Illinois. Yeah. And he graduated with a Bachelor's of Arts. Sorry, people. Also, as a side note with the IQ thing, for anybody who gets hyper fixated on things like that, like I do, when I read that he had an IQ of 152, I was like, okay, cool flex, but like, what's a normal IQ? Mm -hmm. So a normal IQ is between 85 and 115. And then my little ADHD brain was like, okay, well, but like is 152 like really that high like what was einstein's iq einstein's iq was literally 160 so if you're a nosy easily distracted bitch there's your point of reference yeah, i was gonna say 152 is pretty high yeah it's like it's pretty high which i, I had iq know. testing done when i was a kid I looked what that was your iq up. she says One... we don't talk about bruno <laughs> that was 146 Get out of here! Yeah. Oh. But you know, flag. they, they say flag. that they say that IQ is out now, and it's not an accurate way to measure intelligence. That's what the woke people say. Okay. Well, I'm just gonna lump you in with Hitler and Hefner for right now, just to be okay. safe. Wait. Okay. Did we did we talk about Hitler's IQ? We talked about his birthday, you dingle hopper. Didn't he have a high IQ too? Okay, now I gotta Google it. I was gonna say, now I need to know. Did Hitler's they even IQ. have IQs when Hitler was alive? I don't know, fam. Let's see. Some experts claim his IQ oh, was wait, 140. Hitler? Oh, wait a minute. Hitler and you were alive at the same time. Oh my god, I was thinking the same thing too. I was like, uh, oh my god. But I wasn't gonna say it out loud uh, because I'm like out of touch with life. I guess my um, IQ test was probably wrong. <laughs> So, yeah, his, some people say that his IQ was, like, 150 or more. Some people say it was, like, mid-140s. But point being that, like, you, Hitler, and Hefner are in the high IQ April gang gang. <laughs> so, he thought about you guys. Hashtag Aries fam. We're feral, but we're smart. God. So, maybe stay away from Aries, except for Toe. We love a Toe. Mm, I'm also feral and smart, so beautiful don't cross um, me <laughs> i'm scared i don't think we can say that for legal purposes on this podcast for legal pop she says for legal purposes actually maybe cross me cross yeah. me i won't do anything cross um, me so, i'll still love you in general the rest of this episode is kind of going to be like a timeline but i'm going to try not to make it too like chop chop you know what i mean chop, okay chop. Yeah. so 1926 we have that like he was born right Great, check. Okay, so in 1940, Hugh Hefner was a student at Steinmetz High School. He founded the school newspaper, and he presided over the student council and demonstrated the beginnings of a marketable sense of humor with a comic book called School Days that was intended to be, like, somewhat biographical. Now, 1944 to 1949, he served in the military as an infantry clerk and he was a writer and a cartoonist for military newspapers. But in 1946, he was discharged at the end of the war. So I was a little confused by that in the sources, just because it says from 1944 to 1949 he was in the right. military. But it said he was discharged in 46. I don't know how all of that works, if that just means that he was, like, abroad and got to come home. You know what I mean? Like... No, discharge it, basically typically means that you're yeeted. Yeah, so at me, maybe. Let me know, because that, that threw me for a little loop-de-loop. -loop. But either way, he was discharged and got to come home. So Hafner ended up marrying a woman by the name of Mildred Williams, and he graduated on an accelerated track 
from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign with a BA in psychology and a double minor in creative writing and art. Just as a side, I found it interesting that he studied psychology because not to necessarily lump him in with serial killers, although we've kind of already lumped him in with Hitler, so I mean, I guess it is what it is. But there are some like real documented predators who have studied psychology or criminology just to know how to manipulate their victims or get away with crime. Mm. Like Ted Bundy is a prime example. He studied psychology. Anybody who's been following the Brian Kohlberger case, he basically, you know, broke into a flat and murdered several roommates. He isn't convicted at the time of this recording, but he's another good example of somebody who kind of falls into that demographic. He studied criminology, allegedly, in an effort to try to understand how he might commit the perfect crime. At least that's what's speculated. And he even studied under an expert forensic psychologist. Anyway, it just makes me wonder, because it's not really congruent with everything else that Hugh Hefner does in his career path on paper. You know what I mean? Yeah. What was his intention in studying psychology? He wasn't a dumb guy. I mean, the only benefit of the doubt that I can possibly give is that maybe he started out with one intention and, you know, found a different path. But, I, you know, I have I'm inclined to agree. I think that it's shady, you know, and I don't like it. Yeah, I just... I mean, to me, like, what I put in my notes was, like, quote, he wasn't a dumb guy, so to me it feels like a calculated move to understand how to manipulate the human psyche to his benefit, you know what I mean? Like, within the context Mm. of the work he was intending to do. But, you know, like you said, to, to just general benefit of the doubt, we don't know where his head was at in the 1940s, you know, maybe. Moral of the story, though, don't date psych majors. Yeah. Just don't do it. Just say no. Just Unless say no you're a psych, psych major, then shout out you. <laughs> so well, honestly, look, my experience with therapists has been subpar. So. Oh my god, you've had terrifying therapists. You've got to yeah. troubleshoot that. So anyway, Hafner also illustrated cartoons for the paper and edited the campus magazine for the university which was called Shaft, LOL, because I'm 12. He was responsible for introducing Shaft's co-ed of the month feature. In... Oh, it's giving centerfold vibes. Thank you. Thank you. Exactly. It was 1951 when Hafner moved away from his cartooning aspirations, and okay. he ventured into the magazine world as a copywriter of promotional material at Esquire. For those of you who aren't familiar with Esquire, it, it's just like a big magazine. In 1953, Esquire announced plans to move its headquarters to New York. And at that point, Hugh decided to launch his own publication in December of 1953 called, obviously, Playboy. This came after rethinking possible trademark complications from his first title idea, Stag Party, and ended up being the brand that you know, he built his success on and that we recognize so widely today. That said, he obviously, like any other business person, was not guaranteed success when he founded the Playboy magazine. He had to take some pretty extreme moves to pull off the launch, and that included putting his furniture up for sale and raising $8,000 from investors. The first issue sold over 50,000 copies, which was actually almost double the amount that he needed to sell to break even with the things that he had put up or taken out as collateral. Mm. So he did really well with that, that first edition. Yeah. But that said, the first edition is also right away where the problems with Playboy start up. So the first edition, for those of you who don't know, it featured a nude photograph of Marilyn Monroe. It was from a photo shoot of hers from the late 1940s. And according to an article from CNN, Hafner purchased and published this without Marilyn's consent. So already on day one of this magazine launch, we're running into major issues with ethicality and consent. Yeah, that's fucked up. Why are you doing that, Hugh? Super fucked up. I just feel like 
you know, there are consenting adults out there who would have been like, oh, you know, like, I'm trying to make it big. Use me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'm down for Ooh, that. A thousand percent. And instead, like, we have to go that route? Really? That's what we're trying to There's do? There's always people that are willing to show, show their, their ass. ass. <laughs> exactly. And ethically. But no, we, we couldn't do that. Do that. No. So 1954, the magazine was really taking off, and by 1960, it would have over a million subscribers. As of the magazine's second issue, it featured the now widely recognized, like, iconic rabbit logo. Mm -hmm. Um, The brand was sex forward and was obviously in favor of The Bachelor. Like, this was not a brand for women. It was definitely single male targeted not that that stopped sure married males from dabbling and supporting the brand but their their target demographic was younger bachelors you know okay so playboy also memorably published charles beaumont's groundbreaking story quote i don't know why i said quote it's only in quotations because it's the name of a book but it's called the crooked man which marked Hugh Hefner as an early advocate for gay rights. And around this time, he did also help fund the first rape kit, which honestly to me is just so freaking ironic considering the prevalence of, you know, him later using quaaludes, like offering these to I hate her. it. Yeah. It makes me so fucking angry. Yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, like, I helped the first rape kits but how many times did he like coerce consent or like basically blackmail consent or use quaaludes to drug women to get them to do things that they otherwise wouldn't have done if it weren't for the pressure and the drugs and everything you know what i mean fucking lived so long evil never dies swindly little why he lived to be fucking ancient yeah God, well, this brings us to 1959. So, after divorcing Mildred Williams in 1959, Hugh starts to get into television, and he has this short-lived series, which took place between 1959 and 1960, called Playboy's Hmm. Penthouse. Famous guests were featured in the show. Basically, it was like a bachelor pad type talk show was kind of the vibe but it was the first show where performers were desegregated from a racial standpoint and it was very controversial but very important for this time in history why do you keep doing good things and then doing shitty things exactly and that's the thing fam you're gonna see so much of that throughout this and that is why he got away with so much is because he would really play into the good things i just wish that i had been alive at this time and i had known that so that i could say Hugh, I hope you get the shits on your wedding day because the great part is he was married so many times is that he would have had, he like... would have had the shits so much. <laughs> exactly. God. Uh, and if you're new oh. here, that's our go-to. We wish shits on your wedding day to all of our enemies. <laughs> to all of our enemies. And Hugh Hefner is in fact an enemy of the pod. This Official the fact... enemy of the pod. <laughs> yes. So he pushed the same integration, you know, of desegregating within his Playboy clubs in 1961. Mm -hmm. And I even put in my notes, I was like, but it's worth noting that despite this little nugget of not being a shitty person, he was still overall a really shitty person. So I, I stand by that. So now we're in the 1960s. This is when Hefner's like little robe and pipe aesthetic becomes iconic for the brand and playboy is overall at its peak like it does not get better quote unquote than playboy in the 1960s for hugh he develops an enterprise of private pleasure club clubs across the country um Mm -hmm. the first being in chicago these are the desegregated clubs that i was mentioning above he would introduce the playboy bunny hostess during this time and he kind of pushed this new hedonism philosophy which i'll talk about more in a second Hmm. he also would write a series of editorials detailing his new hedonism philosophy in his magazine which he kind of balanced with 
challenging pieces and interviews overall. His philosophy essentially centered on his belief that American culture was poisoned by religious puritanism, and he went against sexual repression, just said that it was overall he considered it to be damaging and unhealthy, and he was motivated by his support for personal freedom, whether it be with regards to sexual freedom or freedom of speech. That's kind of what all this new hedonism hedonism philosophy meant to him and to the brand you know and and i fully support that i fully support you know all of that it's just let's not rate people yeah maybe like the execution was lacking yeah let's just like like, (laughs) you want to be sexually liberated great you want to make it so that people can be integrated great you want to like make it so that people can yeah rape kits like let's support a culture where people can have their naked ass out if they so choose great fully support that but let's just maybe not rape them about it let's not rape them about it yeah that would be a better better way to make better choices good talk i'm glad we had that talk (laughs) okay thanks perfect okay so 1963 he hugh stands trial for obscenity sale charges after an issue of Playboy featuring naked photos of actress Jane Mansfield generates controversy. The charges mm. were ultimately dropped thanks to a hung jury. And a year later, Hugh founded the Playboy Foundation. And this was just like one of his many personal efforts to combat censorship. And the whole censorship thing overall it's just gonna be so ironic i can't stand it's like that's why i say take a shot every time we talk about like how important freedom of speech is to you but not if it applies to a woman not if it applies to a woman literally we see you here and we don't like what we see god i hope you're burning right now you little creep okay so 1969 Remember the the playmates that we were talking about before who are more like hostesses in these clubs? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I just want you guys to like think about the iconic, like original Playboy look. And if you don't know what this is, I will post it on Instagram. But think of those like little strapless bodysuits, the little ears, they have the little tail on the bum. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, we know the ones. Okay. Perfect. So for those of you who don't know, those little tails used to be made of yarn, right? Okay. And up until 1969, that was the case. But in 1969, Papa Hugh did everybody such a favor, guys. Slow clap. Slow clap for him because he really did the Lord's work. So it was in 1969 that he made the gracious decision to replace the yarn bunny tails with flame retardant fake fur tails. You might be like, well, LJ, why was it necessary to do that? Well, because until 1969, it was just a thing that the patrons who would go into the clubs where these playmates would be in costume, essentially, and serving drinks doing their hostess duties part of their occupational hazards was that these pace patrons were known to frequently light their tails on fire what the fuck yeah yeah so in 1969 he was like okay ladies i guess i will give you flame retardant fake fur tails you've earned it (laughs) (laughs) right so, I hate that. So generous. Men, do better. Just do better for me, please. Thank Honestly, you. can you guys just actually do the bare fucking minimum and not suck? And like, maybe you just don't... not light women on literal fire who are just trying to serve <laughs> drinks at their job. Honestly, you don't even have to do a good job. Just, just do don't a do job. The bad one. <laughs> like, just don't make the absolute worst choices. Can you do that for me? That's your homework uh, for this week. I'm just kidding because the men who are listening to this podcast are actually probably men who like hype up women because they're here listening. But like, maybe tell your friends. Tell your yeah. friends. Perfect. Uh, every behind every like quote good guy, I feel like it's a problematic friend. 
And it is your duty, nay, nay, your obligation <laughs> to tell them not to light women's butts on fire. Do that for me, please. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're still lighting the butts on fire for me. <laughs> like, why? Can we just not? Can we just Come not? On. Okay, do we, do we know of any, like, severe, I just have to know, do we know if any, like, severe injuries or even deaths resulted from the tail lightings? I don't know. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sure, like, at least people were I mean, were, like, I would hope that they were quickly extinguished. Yeah, I would hope that they were probably, quickly extinguished, but, these like. These poor girlies were probably walking around with, like, little water cups being like, hey, girl, butt's on fire. Let me, I got you. I got you. <laughs> Bring your tail over here. Like, was this life for women in the 1960s? Because surely it would be life for women now in a club if they had little tails Stop. on their butts. would be getting cold. Ugh, Stop okay. walking around. <laughs> I'm I'm glasses. Honey, pop a squad. <laughs> hey, girl. <laughs> Gotta extinguish your little your little bun bun tail. Okay. All right. This brings us to 1971. Okay. So at this point, Hugh Hefner buys the mansion. Um, Playboy Enterprises goes public and the brand becomes a publishing, modeling, merchandising media empire. So at this time, the Playboy magazine is capping out at 7 million issues sold per month. And it had 900,000 members worldwide at the company's resorts, hotels, casinos, Playboy clubs, which there were 23 Playboy clubs at this time. Competition from rival magazines like Hustler and Penthouse also contributed to what would now begin to be the decline for the Playboy magazine. In 1975, Hugh Hefner moves into the Playboy mansion in Holmby Hills, California, Um, Mm full-time. And at this point, we're going to start getting into, like, the real, like, juicy tea-type stuff. And there's still a long ways to go. So I'm thinking this is a good place to cliffhanger. And we're going to make this a two-parter where we are going to pick up on this next episode, which will be immediately available for Patreons. There's going to be talks of FBI drug busts. We're going to be getting into child sexual abuse in the mansion. There's a prostitution ring to talk about. There is the bestiality issue to address. We've got a lot going on in episode two. So this was really just like setting the foundation. And episode two, we're getting into the meat, honey. We've got things to talk about. We've got things to talk about. Perfect. I can't wait to get into the meat. (laughs) That's why Chase said. (laughs) Beautiful. Well, we will see you guys back for episode two. Thanks for hanging in for the background. But, you know, Playboy is, like, such an expansive... Like, it's a decades-long industry. You know what I mean? So there's there's a lot to talk about. But this second episode is going to have, like, all the stuff that you guys are really coming here for. Like, and it's going to be a good one. So... Thanks for hanging in for the background and buckle up for episode two. Okay, to Lou. Bye. Oh no! Did we perform a fuckeroni?